Good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. And thanks to everyone that was involved in making this very important day happen. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, first, I'd like to situate corporate constitutional rights, or what might be called corporate personhood, in the larger context of corporate personality issues. And then two, focus in on corporate constitutional rights uh, and provide a brief overview of what rights corporations have that have been recognized by the Supreme Court. And in doing this, I'll pick up on some points that professors Jessica Levinson and Adam Winkler made earlier. Um, but what I'd like to do is take an even broader view and provide kind of a, a more simple, my way of thinking of this with a mental or conceptual framework to parse out the different corporate personality issues and then putting in historical context the development of constitutional rights for corporations. Uh, I've written a short paper on this for the, uh, for the conference as well, which is available on the website. So first, situating corporate uh, constitutional rights within the realm of corporate personality. The idea of corporate personality is comprised of a few conceptually distinct notions or ideas. One, the entity status of corporations. Two, statutory issues, uh, which you could also put into this category, perhaps, state constitutional issues. And three, the treatment of corporations under the US Constitution. So I'll say a bit about each of these. First, the entity status of corporations under the law, or what I might call legal personality. Legal personality was established long before the question even arose about how to treat corporations under the US Constitution. Uh, by at least as early as the 18th century, and perhaps quite a bit earlier, English law had established corporations as having certain abilities or uh, characteristics under the law. And the idea was that members could be united into a corporation and that there would be this legal fiction that that thing would be treated like a separate entity under the law. And the things that flowed from this idea of legal personality included the ability to contract in the name of the corporation, the ability to hold property in the corporate name, and to sue and be sued in the corporate name. It also included a conception of the corporation as potentially having perpetual existence, uh, or at least an existence that wasn't tied to the lifespans of its members, in contrast to the partnership form of business. Limited liability for shareholders developed over time. So the idea of a separate corporate existence was important because of these abilities. It allowed corporate participants to lock in capital to that separate entity and to partition corporate assets from the assets of the participants. This is core to what the corporation is in many ways. Uh, it's what made the corporate form so useful for raising capital from a broad group of investors and building lasting institutions. And this is part of what arguably has fueled uh, our economic development in our country uh, and spurred the Industrial Revolution and a lot of economic growth. So that's entity status or legal personality. Second situating point of corporate personality. Statutory laws, both state and federal, have often included corporations in their definitions section, either expressly referring to corporations in the relevant statutory text uh, or defining the term person to include corporations to make clear that the statute applies to corporations. Statutes that do not expressly include corporations or define person to mean corporations can give rise to ambiguity because of this custom that we have of some statutes doing that. And when we have that sort of ambiguity, it often has to be resolved by the courts. So for example, last year in FCC v. AT&T, the Supreme Court held that corporations don't have a personal privacy right for purposes of the Freedom of Information Act, um, which protects disclosure from uh, certain law enforcement records. So corporations don't have that as a matter of statutory interpretation. Currently before the Supreme Court this year, uh, in Kiobel v. Royal Dutch Petroleum is, amongst other issues, the question of whether the alien tort statute passed by Congress in 1789 
uh, applies to corporations or only to human beings directly. And so this year the court may address whether corporations can be sued in the US, in US courts under the Alien Tort Statute for human rights violations that occurred entirely in another country. So these cases illustrate that how there may be questions of statutory interpretation regarding whether corporations are covered in light of language concerning persons or the like, and, and they may be uh, quite important. Finally, there's the question of how to treat corporations under the US Constitution. So I'm still talking about this universe of what do we mean when we say a corporation is a person, and I've said there's the entity status, there's the statutory issues, and now I'm talking about what a lot of people talk about when they talk about corporate personhood, which is how do we treat corporations under the US Constitution, given that the US Constitution doesn't specifically refer to corporations. And so it's been left to the courts to figure out whether corporations can be the subject of constitutional protections, that is, rights holders, and whether those rights would be coextensive with the rights of individuals. Uh, so the Supreme Court, as Professor Adam Winkler mentioned, hasn't addressed these issues in uh, a holistic way. Rather, the court has made incremental decisions on a case-by-case -case basis and without a unified theory of what a corporation is. And that's led to some inconsistencies in the court's reasoning over time. Uh, and in some, over time, on an ad hoc basis, the court has recognized corporations as having a panoply of rights. Not necessarily the same as what individuals have, but I would call it a panoply. Uh, and I think of it in terms of three kind of broad categories. Rights associated with contract and property interests, rights associated with trials and searches, and rights associated with speech. So now I'm focusing in specifically on that second part of what I want to do, give this broad overview of what constitutional rights corporations have. And to put it in a bit of historical context, so over there you see pre-1800, we have the US Constitution that doesn't specifically refer to corporations. And then in the 1800s, we have the first cases concerning corporate constitutional rights. And they concerned contract and property interests. Uh, Professor Winkler talked about that 1819 case, Dartmouth College. That was one of the earliest cases. And the Supreme Court recognized that corporations were protected by the contracts clause of the Constitution, which forbids a state from impairing existing contractual obligations. And the court reasoned that the corporate charter represented a contract between the individuals who incorporated the entity, that separate entity, and the state. And therefore, the state couldn't unilaterally amend the charter of a private college and effectively convert it into a public uh, institution. So for contracts clause purposes, this recognized the corporation as a contract creating a separate entity through which people carried on business or identified objectives, and it protected the individuals behind the entity. In the late 1800s, the Supreme Court established constitutional protection of corporate property. And here we get to that famous Santa Clara case, uh, which is often traced to this time as the root of the corporate personhood doctrine. It, it's kind of just become so well known that uh, that's how people like to refer to it. Uh, but there's, there's a lot more context to that. Since uh, Professor Winkler discussed the case in some detail, I'm just going to underscore the fact that that decision came in the context of property. And uh, I think it's also important to note that there were other cases right around that time in which it wasn't just in the head notes, it was in the opinion. And the court considered these issues and said, uh, corporations have also Fifth and 14th Amendment due process protections for corporate property. And the idea was that corporate property is indirectly individual's property. Uh, so in the 19th century, in the 1800s, the court recognized corporations as having the protection of the Contracts Clause and the protection of the 14th and 5th Amendment in the context of property. In the early 1900s, the court began to recognize corporations as having certain rights associated with trials and searches. And this came about because corporations were now being held subject to criminal liability. Early common law, didn't impose criminal responsibility on corporations because courts had been struggling, these early courts, with the idea of what is a corporation 
And can we attribute an act and an intent to a corporation as we could to a criminal defendant, an individual? But by the early 20th century, these, the early 1900s, courts had started to take a broader approach by importing tort and agency principles to hold corporations vicariously liable for criminal acts performed by their corporate agents. In addition, federal regulation of economic activity through criminal statutes like antitrust laws uh, had grown by this time in the early 1900s, in part also because of that industrial revolution and now there was this uh, more corporations, quite frankly, in the country, and they were bigger and had a uh, bigger impact on daily life. And uh, so this had queued up issues concerning the government's power to prosecute corporations. In 1909, uh, in New York Central, the Supreme Court definitively answered that question and recognized corporate criminal liability based on the doctrine of this vicarious liability respondeat superior. And around this time came that case that Professor Winkler mentioned, uh, Hale v. Henkel, in which the court said, corporations have some Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable searches and seizures, but corporations don't have a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And it seems like the court's treatment of corporations, it didn't rest on some textual basis of saying, a corporation is a person, they get all these rights. It was much more pragmatic uh, because the Fourth Amendment uses the word people and the Fifth Amendment similarly uses the word person. So it wasn't just based on saying a corporation is a person. Uh, it, it looks like pragmatism drove that decision as granting corporations the privilege against self-incrimination could have significantly impeded corporate criminal liability that was growing at the time, uh, whereas recognizing corporations as having some Fourth Amendment rights wouldn't have entirely shielded corporations from that prosecution. Also noteworthy is that in thinking about this uh, trials and searches rights that was happening in the 1900s, is that the court didn't say that the protection of corporations was coextensive with the rights of individuals. It gave some rights to corporations in this context of trials and searches, but it didn't necessarily say that it was the same scope of protection. Uh, and besides ruling on the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, the court also addressed uh, other constitutional protections. It recognized that corporations could claim the protection of the double jeopardy clause, and seemingly that corporations have Sixth and Seventh Amendment entitlements to trial by jury in at least some contexts. Some open questions still remain about the uh, rights related to trials and searches of corporations. Uh, open questions include whether corporations have protection against the Eighth Amendment uh, excessive fines, whether corporations receive protection under the Sixth and Seventh, uh, or Sixth Amendment assistance of counsel clause and whether corporations have a right to be indicted by a grand jury. Those are open questions. Finally, we get to speech rights. And this is what I think is useful about putting this in historical context. Uh, jurisprudence regarding corporate speech rights is of the most recent vintage and has arguably reflected the greatest expansion of corporate rights. It was not a given that corporations would have these rights or that they would be at all comparable in breadth as those that individuals enjoy. Because as we've seen, the court said co corporations don't have a Fifth Amendment uh, privilege against self-incrimination. Also, corporations are not citizens uh, under the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Corporations don't have a right to vote. Uh, and, with and with limited exception, that gross gene case that was mentioned earlier, the question of corporate speech didn't arise until about the 1970s. And in the 1970s, the Supreme Court recognized corporations as having some rights in the context of commercial speech, which is that Virginia Pharmacy case that Professor Winkler was discussing, as well as political speech, like the Bilotti case that Professor Levinson was discussing. So I'm going to leave it there because I think they, uh, I don't need to cover that ground again. But um, I'm happy to answer questions, and I turn it over to my next co-panelist.